Hi guys, welcome back aboard good old Athena for yet more DIY fun and sailing. Yep, that's right. Athena is actually going to leave the marina this week. Somebody should check if hell is frozen over. If you're new to our channel, this is Athena. I've spent the last five years on a somewhat extensive refit, complete with a very extensive osmosis treatment, rebuilding the entire deck, glassing over the deck hole joint and then painting the top sides, gutting most of the interior to make structural repairs and then subsequently rebuilding most of the interior. All of that fun is documented in 434 videos right here on YouTube. My name is Mess and this is my fiance Ava and this week for the first time since I purchased Athena five years ago we're actually going sailing. We have to start testing the boat before we leave for the UK. We also have to get out of Skiva because there's going to be a huge music festival here with thousands and thousands of people in the marina. As you might be able to see there's a stagey looking thing over there, there's a couple more over there and it's a pretty big festival. The invading horde should be approaching our front door a little bit later today. I'm not sure we're going to be able to leave today because we're waiting for some parts to show up that we need to install the second chat clutter out in the cockpit. But once we have those parts, which should be today or tomorrow, the plan is to grab a mooring ball about an hour north of the marina and then hang out there until the festival is over. That'll also allow us to configure the last bit of the autopilot and some other projects aboard the boat. But before we can actually leave, we have some quick projects we need to check off the list and also a lot of tidying up to do. First on the to-do list was to do an oil change on our D240 engine. A while back I picked up one of these oil extractor 6000s. It might be fine if you only need to do one oil change a year, but holy guacamole Batman, this thing doesn't suck. As in it's horribly slow. It took a lot of pumping and a lot of babysitting to get these 6 liters of oil extracted. I've ordered a 12 volt gear pump to use instead. That'll be easier and a lot easier. Faster. While the oil extractor was sucking at sucking, I changed the impeller. The old one was about 5 years old, but it only had 100 hours on it, so it looked basically new. But better safe than sorry. The oil was finally done draining, so I got out fresh fuel and oil filters from the spare parts bin. I don't have an official filter loosening tool, but I do have a piece of line and that did the trick. The engine should now be good to go to get us to the UK. Before we can put up sail and let the boat heal, there are some electronic gizmos and controllers in the battery compartment that need to be secured. Clearly this is not perfect, there's more cable management needed in there, but our high output alternator on the engine is still not working. And I don't want to take care of that last bit of cable management before that's sorted, so yeah, this is certainly good enough for now. Yesterday we also cleared the deck and prepped to install the last little bit of deck hardware so we can get some lines let aft into the cockpit. That thickened epoxy in those holes is not quite ready to drill holes in yet, so we'll get back to that later. Instead, let's turn our attention to this little guy, the Garmin GPS Map 86. I. Judging from Garmin's website, this little guy is pretty freaking awesome. Essentially, it is a portable, watertight, floating chart plotter with in-reach capabilities, meaning it's also a two-way satellite communicator. Sounds pretty dang spiffy, if you ask me. Of course, it's not as full-fledged of a chart plotter as, for instance, the 922 I've got here. This is the one I'm going to be installing out in the cockpit a little bit later, or the 922 over there at the nav station. But as a little backup device, I think it sounds amazing. I had an original inReach device when I sailed Athena home from Scotland, but since then, Garmin has purchased inReach, and I've noticed a little inReach icon on my chart plotter, so I'm pretty excited to see what that'll do. What the in each part of this product gives us is a two-way satellite communicator on the Iridium network. So that means we've got global coverage. On there we can do two-way text messages, we can do location sharing so you guys can follow along see where the boat is. We can also do stuff like potentially post to social media but I'm gonna have to check that out because I'm not entirely sure that still works but we'll see. And then we can also get some basic weather forecast information. The 86i will also give us a two-way SOS feature. Now if we set off an EPIRB that will transmit a signal up to some satellites with our precision that will then get relayed to search and rescue. But there's no two-way communication, so it's just us broadcasting. With this, at least we'll be able to talk to the person in the other end to know that somebody has actually seen that we're in trouble. Oh yeah, and this little guy should also act as a remote for our autopilot and be able to stream various data from the boat networks. In the box there was the 86i itself, manual, USB cable and this cool little cradle for charging the device. Let me go ahead and blaze through the activation of the inReach here and then we can take a look at the interface. But as you can see, 
it's not a touch interface, it's got this little pad down here which is both good and bad, but yeah, let me take care of the activation. The activation does require the use of a computer with an internet connection, but it's pretty cool that it comes up and asks me if I wanted to switch out my old InReach SE device with the new 86i, so yeah, it's taking care of that now. Then it's just a matter of activating my subscription again, and I think we'll spring for the big one to have unlimited text messages. After the activation, I decided to load the same chart that I have on my chart plotter onto the 86i. Garmin Express is well known for being not so express. While waiting for the map to download, we took care of some other projects like mounting the last bit of deck hardware and the hinges on the lids of the settee. Good morning, guys. It is a beautiful Saturday morning. We spent the night here at a mooring ball about 20 minutes from the marina. It is very quiet here after a couple of days of festival rowdiness. The map's finished downloading this night, so uh, let's bring this guy inside and take a quick look. It is pretty freaking awesome to have the same charts I have on my full-fledged chart plotter on this little ruggedized portable waterproof device. And sure, the interface with the push buttons here is a little bit clunky. It kind of reminds me of my old chart plotter aboard Obelix. But on the other hand, the buttons are easier to use with cold or wet fingers than a touchscreen. I've activated the tracking feature in the inReach part of the device. That means every five minutes this will post our current position via satellite to a website and we'll have a link for that website on our Patreon page. This is the main menu of the 86i and as you can see there are a lot of icons here. This thing can do a lot of different stuff so it's gonna take me a little bit of time to get familiar with it. I should have a chance to play around with the 86i tonight to get a little bit more familiar with it but before then I want to get it paired with the chart plotter so we can also play around with that. And just like that, we are connected. Very exciting. It looks like we can send and receive preset messages here. So yeah, that's probably gonna be very convenient to be able to do that. I wish I had more time to play with the 86i right now, but we gotta get going. We're going to the yard to drop off the solar panels. Unfortunately, our solar arch will need some reinforcing before we can sail with the solar panels in place. And the solar panels we've got are pretty huge and they won't fit in through the companionway. I've tried my very best to find somebody local to reinforce the arch for us before we leave, but I've been unsuccessful. Up until now, we've just been storing the solar panels up here, but that's not a good solution for when we start sailing. In a rare instance of good luck, a friend of mine is actually looking for four of these exact solar panels. So he's offered to buy them from us so that we can just buy new solar panels when we get to the UK and we've had the arch reinforced. And that's why we're going to the yard. We need to drop these off and then we can go out and try to put up a sail. The thing about the yard is that it's kind of tricky to get in there. It's very shallow. So to get in there, it is really nice to have a depth sound we have one right here. It's just not installed yet. This is the Airmar DST810 and by installed I mean we just have to smush this part into the accompanying through hole part. So installation should be very easy. There was a little note in the box that said to make absolutely sure you replace this yellow o-ring with a black o-ring. So we better do that first. I think this is the right black one. It's the biggest one that was in there. So that should be good. We might see a little bit of water come into the boat when we install this, but hopefully it shouldn't be too bad. Well, here goes nothing. Please don't sink the boat. And just like that, through the magic of NMEA 2000, we've got depth on our DMI 20 displays. The DST10 has an app for configuring the sensor. So uh, let's see if this works. Please give your sensor a unique name to display with the application and select your boat kind. Okay, so sensor max sensorson. And we are a sailboat, as we should hopefully demonstrate a little bit later today. Let's do a quick depth measurement in the real world so we can figure out the offset for the depth here. As is most commonly used by most professionals to do a real world depth sounding, we'll use a piece of line and a broken caulk gun because, well, that's all we've got. So right now we are sitting in roughly three meters and... 30 centimeters worth of water. So I'll add 30 centimeters as an offset and that should be the calibration done. We need to get going, but our new MDI box still hasn't shown up. So the only way to start the engine right now is with a screwdriver. 
let's untie and uh, get out of here. Bye bye, quaint little hillside. We'll see you in a couple days. If you just uh, stay at the helm, I'll go down and start the uh, uh, sea trial configuration of the autopilot. Okay. The guide had us do one and a half circles with the boat, no doubt to calibrate the compass, and then it did a zigzag pattern for a little bit. It was really cool to finally be able to see the autopilot turn the wheel. We've just engaged the autopilot after the configuration and it is keeping us on a steady course. Let's see if we can go a little bit to starboard. Yeah, it's turning us. With the autopilot steering us, we might as well see if we can get this little optional autopilot remote control configured. Actually, I don't know if we need batteries for this thing. They might not be included. I don't know if we... Uh-oh. Do we have batteries? We did, of course, not have batteries readily available, but when we dropped off the solar panels, I was able to find a pair. This is a pretty nice little unit here, so uh, let's go ahead and take care of the pairing. There sure does seem to be a lot of pairing required nowadays, but at least it's not like it used to be with Bluetooth where it would fail every other time. These days, it just seems to kind of work. Menu, setup, remote, and search for remote. And then on the remote, pair with a GHC and done. A little bit later today, we'll have to head back to the marina to charge the batteries because we don't have solar, we don't have a genset, we don't have a working alternator. Shore power is right now our only way of charging the batteries, which is immensely frustrating. But uh, yeah, hopefully that trip will give us a chance to try out this little guy. But before we go, I'd love to install the chart plotter up in the cockpit. We have the chart plotter itself, the 922, the same as at the nav station. I've also picked up a, another port extender to not have to run a cable all the way into the forward cabin. And I've picked up a couple of these scan strut cable seals. Let's start by liberating the chart plotter. I've already made one video about installing a 922, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail. The one at the nav station is flush mounted. For this one, we're gonna use the included little bracket. I should easily be able to fit the three cables I need through this guy, and that is power, enemy 2000, and network. And that means we can save this guy for something else. I've been going back and forth on what would be the best position to install this little guy. I thought maybe at the helm was the best one, but then I got to thinking that this is actually gonna be better for when we're on passage. One of us is always gonna be sitting here or over here on watch, and being able to check the chat plotter here for radar or AIS is gonna be super convenient. If we can get a good deal on a 722, that's the seven inch version of the 922, then we might add one of those here at the helm and have this kind of modified a little bit. But uh, yeah, that is definitely a project for sometime in the UK this winter. I did leave a little room when we put in this clutch here to make sure that there was enough room for the chart putter. So yeah, that should work very well. And also the companionway can open and close. So let's go ahead and get this mounted and run some cables. <laughs> The instructions for this cable seal mentioned to put the rubber bit in the freezer because you have to drill the holes yourself and apparently that's supposed to make it easier. Now to drill those holes we need to find a drill that is 0.5 millimeters bigger than the cable. And of course none of the cables are the same diameter so uh, yeah, this will be interesting. Let's see if we get lucky. I think we may indeed be lucky here, but this one is 0.2 millimeters smaller than it should be. So yeah, I don't know. Let's see how it goes. 0.5 millimeters, my rear end. There is no way those holes were big enough. I've had to enlarge them by quite a bit. Maybe that's because I didn't leave the rubber plug in the freezer long enough, but yeah, definitely had to make them bigger. With the cable securely attached to the chat plotter, that takes care of the outside part of the installation. The wiring for the chat plotter comes from up here, goes through this bulkhead inside of this locker, gets connected to the distribution panel, to the NMA2000 network, and to the marine network. As you can see, I've installed the switch down there and getting the RJ45 connector on the cable was probably the most tricky part of this whole wiring thing 
But yeah, as you can see, I definitely need more cable management in here, but that's something we can easily wait to do until we get to the UK. So let's just hide all of my sins and see if we can get that second check plotter up and running. The sun is right there, so I don't know if the camera is going to be able to pick up the screen on the check plotter, but it's asking me to choose if this station here is the main helm, the fry bridge, docking, tower, whatever. So let's say it is cockpit. Now I need to go through all of the same steps I went through when I set up the first chart plotter and seeing as you guys can't really see what's going on on the screen, let's just jump over this. It ended up being kind of late before we could leave the marina after charging our batteries. It was a stunningly beautiful sunset with the festival blaring in the background. Coming back out to find the mooring ball, it was really nice to have the chart plotter right there in the cockpit so we could simply just follow our track from earlier in the day. It is a gorgeous Sunday morning and I think it's time for Athena to finally spread her wings and fly, meaning put up the sails. I'm not sure how much sailing we're actually going to be able to do because there's about one knot of wind. I've readied all of our lines. I know Ava has one or two things she'd like to take care of before we start sailing. When we were going through all of Athena's things, we found these old weather cloths and we got really excited about them. We threw them in the wash to clean them and when we pulled them out, pretty much all the letters were falling off. And then we quickly realized they're pretty tattered and old and we'll definitely have to make new ones. But for now, I decided just to hand sew the letters back on and we're gonna put them up because it'll be nice to have some protection from the wind on our way to the UK. Like Ava said, the old ones are a little tattered, but also they're kind of the wrong size. The new ones we make are gonna have to be just a little bit longer to make it to the stanchion. Another thing we have to do before we go is put up our flags. We have our sail life pendant and our Danigan. Our Mishamark flag. It's a Michigan Denmark flag. I saw a map of this image on the internet. It's Denmark fitting perfectly inside of Michigan and I thought it was so cool. I had it made in Michigan and Denmark colors and got it printed on a flag for mats. We do need to pick up more flag line but that's kind of what today is going to be all about. Figuring out the stuff we need because, well, it's definitely not going to be about speed records today. We've had zero knots of wind all morning. Now we've got three. It looks like a storm is a brewing. There are some windmills over here that are turning pretty good. So maybe if we head over in this direction, we might be able to get a bit of wind. But yeah, like I said, not going to be a speed record day. I think we've got something in the aft end of our boom that's causing a little bit too much friction to pull out the mainsail. So we're just going to have to do that by hand. We're doing it! We're actually doing it! We're sailing, not motoring, and Ava is behind the helm. We also need to figure out some fair leads for that line so we're not reliant on cardboard for anti-chafing. So yeah, but that should be easily fixed. There are a few minor things we need to fix before we can do any serious sailing, but it was nothing short of amazing to finally, after five years of hard work, be able to take Athena out sailing. Other than the missing fair leads and the friction issue with the furling main, everything seemed to be in working order. A nice, sunny, calm day out on the water. We were screaming along at a blistering four knots, enjoying life, trying to get some drone shots of Athena on the sail. Then the drone hit some kind of magical distance from its launch point and refused to follow along with us. We turned the engine off, came up into the wind and headed back to the drone and rescued the poor little thing. All of us, which includes the drone, are now safely back at the first mooring ball from a few days ago. I think I'll be reaching out to a fellow Warrior 38 YouTube sailing channel called Sailing Kadoa. They do awesome videos and awesome drone stuff and I'd like to see if I could get just a few tips on how to use the drone because that seems very difficult to me but uh, yeah I'll leave a link for their channel down in the description. As has become the tradition we'll end the video by updating our little to-do board. These are the tasks that's standing between us and being able to sail and we've closed a lot of tasks this week. In the spirit of getting things done we haven't filmed all of it but mm -hmm. let's go ahead and close the tasks that we can close. We can close this one drawer front so those are all installed. We can close this one new countertop on kitchen mm -hmm. island. We can close the trim for the head. We can Trim's close the, ring. yep, the rigging has been trimmed, pressurized water done, door for the head is done, the boom main sheet attachment is done. Mm -hmm. We also changed the oil this week. Yep. We fixed the ventilation for the head. Yep. And 
we also installed and configured the autopilot already. Securing the diesel tank shouldn't be a difficult one. Installing the Jenny, that should hopefully happen the beginning of next week. Then we have mount the pot holder and rerun wiring to stove. That shouldn't be that difficult either. I need to go to the dentist next week. Yikes. And then we have install and configure the alternator, the stupid alternator. We noticed the boat is healing a little bit starboard. It must be all that work we've put in over the past two months. Look at all those post-its. A new alternator is getting shipped here. It should get here on Friday, which is great. Hopefully that one works out. If it doesn't, then we will revert back to the stock 12 volt alternator just to get moving because yeah, like we said in the previous video, Ava's shanking clock is up pretty soon and we need to get started moving. Fingers crossed either the alternator installation or the genset gets up and running next week so we'll have a way other than shore power to recharge the batteries. That is really what's keeping us from going. So yeah, we need that fixed and we need it fixed fast. But uh, yeah, there should be plenty more fun DIY stuff coming up next week. So we mm -hmm. hope to see all of you guys back here about Athena next Sunday. As always, feel free to leave a comment down below and don't forget, if you've enjoyed this video, please remember to leave a like. See you.